Okay, looks like we're live. Hi, I'm Graham. I'm going to show you a couple things about the uh, MIT device. It stands for Ma Magnetic Implosion Transformer. I'm not sure if that's the right name or not. I don't even care. Um, this is the device, and I call it the MIT. Let's go through some of the basic parts. Uh, we start with a DC power supply that's putting out a little less than uh, 300 volts at a low current. Up here is our output power. Uh, this it's about nine and a half watts, and that's being run through a car tail lamp bulb, so we can see it's caloric power, the real thing. Here's our input watt, watt meter of the device. It's showing six, eh, somewhere in the neighborhood of half a watt of real power going in, and nine and a half watts of uh, real power coming out. <coughs> Excuse me, although there's a, only a fractional watt of real power coming in, there's plenty of RMS current, RMS voltage uh, going there. It's just that the, uh, the time average of the product of those two is zero. All works out to zero. Uh, here's the device adorned in permanent magnets. It's got some coils in it. Uh, here's the output board and the output capacitors. Uh, and here's the driver section. There's some resonating capacitors, a large inductor, and a MOSFET switching board. Try to zoom in there. Whatever's on that. Whole bunch of nice stuff. Switches some MOSFETs. All the MOSFETs in this are uh, silicon carbides, so they're, uh, for these purposes, effectively lossless when on and effectively lossless when off. And they switch in about five or 10 nanoseconds, depending on how they're adjusted. Um, so they're approaching an ideal switch, at least for the purposes of this device. The oscilloscope uh, is also being used as a watt meter. Um, the oscilloscope shows a slightly different picture. We see a little over nine and a half watts of power on the output, and a slightly negative power on the resonant circuit of the input. This oscilloscope is using a differential uh, voltage probe and a clamp-on uh, current probe. Here's one of the clamp-on current probes. Uh, the alligator clips of the differential voltage probe, which is located back there. Uh, there can be uh, time skew and phasing issues with those that cause a little bit of uncertainty in the power measurement. So I do a second measurement using a second current probe and two high voltage probes on either side of the resonant tank. Those go into this oscilloscope and the two of its channels in the oscilloscope uh, takes the arithmetic difference of those uh, to perform the differential function. So we get a math trace on the oscilloscope in this uh, orange waveform here. It resembles the differential probe's voltage waveform as well. Essentially the same waveform. Current waveform here is in blue on the primary. Current waveform here is in yellow on this oscilloscope. This oscilloscope, by using that alternate uh, measurement method, shows about a quarter watt of real power on the input. Uh, so we're measuring that uh, power on the input three ways. On this oscilloscope it says positive a quarter watt. This oscilloscope says about negative a quarter watt. And the Clark has a uh, watt meter. Sorry for the focus on this. Let's see if we can correct that. Clark has a uh, watt meter here says it's about half a watt. So in any case, substantially less than the nine and a half watts we see on the output. There's a couple funny things about this invention. Let me take a seat and try to walk through them. Uh, it's got a stack of permanent magnets on it which are fine-tuned by the stack of magnets on top here. I just lay them on top uh, and it has, has uh, two U-shaped stacks of magnets here that bias uh, the top core with a large coil of lits on it. That core becomes a non-linear resonator. Um, and it's a little bit disguised in the way that the waveforms work here, but we can see the peak positive current here is a little above uh, three vertical divisions on the oscilloscope, so a little above three amps, a uh, little above uh, two amps of absolute value on the negative. So here we're going into saturation, although we flat top because the uh, we get a clamping action, so the coil is effectively shorted there. Uh, and here we short again on the negative direction when the this coil is out of saturation. When it's out of saturation, it's driving the magnetic flux into this lower core, which is the output coils. There's some rather unusual activity here because these output coils feed uh, through a MOSFET that's normally on about 98% of the time uh, directly into some electrolytic capacitors. It's a little strange if you consider uh, 
uh, that the operating frequency here is 39.18 kilohertz. So we were feeding the AC current induced here uh, through a MOSFET that's on all the time, practically on all, on all the time, into these electrolytic capacitors which are bypassed with some film capacitors. Creating on the output, the output is not AC, uh, you can see the output voltage there in violet is a substantially steady DC. If we turn off all the other traces, uh, we see that the mark is down there at 2 volts of division, so we go 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, just about 10 volts corroborated by the Clark Hess reporting 9.78 volts and it's DC. There's DC current coming out of course that goes through this little wire up through the Clark Hess output watt meter and into the load bank which right now is set to the highest resistance possible and shunted with this lamp so we can get a visible in indication of the power. However the current feeding into the capacitor bank is not DC it's AC with a DC offset. There's the output current waveform, although it's zero centered right there, so you can see it goes positive a lot more than it goes negative. That's in line with the greater positive excursion of the primary core when it's saturated. So we get a AC current or an AC-DC current wave with an average or a mean current of about 990 milliamps. Clark Hess echoes that. It's about 979 by its count. We have about an average of an amp. The interesting thing here is that by feeding those uh, output coils directly into these capacitors, it's essentially an AC short. So to the AC, or the induced EMF, uh, this thing thinks it's shorted. But because the DC component exists and has been induced, that's where we get our power. And of course, DC doesn't go through transformers, so the DC component does not really reflect back to the input, and we don't really pay for it. That's what makes the energy free. That's why we're getting 10 watts for practically no input. Here's the output waveform, which I don't often share because it's one of the secrets of the device. Uh, let's ignore the orange trace. That's the input voltage right now. And let's look here. This is the output waveform. We see it's a flat DC of a slightly negative value during most of the time. Then the MOSFET turns off and we have a nice spike. Oddly enough, that spike appears all by itself. When the MOSFET turns off, it turns off right about here. Then a short time later, the spike appears. And then after the spike is done, we set a timer and this circuitry over here to turn the MOSFET back on. There's a couple potentiometers in there that set the timing of the MOSFET's opening and closure. And that'd be these output MOSFETs here. When they open, the spike appears uh, such that the total EMF averaged out over time on these output coils is almost zero. Of course in a transformer by definition it must be zero. We'll see later that this device actually breaks that and we are inducing indeed a little bit of direct current which is supposed to be a heresy in electromagnetism although it is evidently happening here. So that's our output waveform. When the MOSFETs are on we have that little bit of DC. Remember this is a, at 100 volts of division so if we expand it we begin to see on the 10 volt scale that being the zero reference, we're about 10 volts down. So that's the DC. Right after that, the spike turns on. With thermal drift, it's changed a little bit, so after the spike is done, the body diodes of those MOSFETs turn on, then the gate uh, turns on and the body diode drop goes away. It happens so quickly that that's a relatively negligible loss power-wise. It's nice to tune it out, but it's not a big deal. Uh, what else do we have? Um, there's a bit of input inefficiency, actually a lot of it, going on. This is a MOSFET H bridge, but the circuit works best. We'll bring the input wave back. Uh, when we're not driving a pure sine wave. So we're taking the direct current from our high voltage supply, feeding it through this inductor, and that inductor becomes the positive terminal of the H bridge. So the H bridge is not fed by a voltage, it's essentially fed by a current, at least in the frequency regime we're working with. Now those two yellow wires are the H-bridge outputs, which drive the capacitors. The current is intercepted on its way to the coil by the Clark Hess, along with the voltage and everything else so that we can analyze the power. Um, but it all ends up basically as zero watts. Unfortunately, um, and I don't really know why this is, even though the two H-bridges are driven with square waves, half the time the current is contrary to them, so it flows through the MOSFET that is off, and won't flow through the MOSFET that is on. 
When it flows through the MOSFET is off, it is going the opposite direction, so it engages the body diode. And in silicon carbide MOSFETs, that's a couple of volts uh, times the several amperes in the input current, so a lot of power gets burnt in this. So we're sending power in from the DC supply. It goes into this tank, and then it gets burned up in these MOSFETs, and we have to send more in. So an improved circuit here that doesn't have that body diode drop would not burn it up, and we'll have a lower net DC input. So just to clarify, these watt meters are attached literally to the input coil, like we would with a transformer or anything else. Regardless of what's driving it, we intercept the current and the voltage right at the input winding, which is here, and attach a watt meter so we can see just the power flow that's going into the actual magnetics of it. That's effectively zero watts or less than a watt depending on how you count it, at least as reported by these machines. Now we could find all three watt meters are somehow wrong, although usually when you have a bunch of different watt meters hooked up that are all working different ways, if they all agree it gives an additional measure of certainty, which is why I'm making this video and uh, pretty confident I'm not wasting my time or yours. Right here we can see that that yellow wave is a little bit above zero when the current is negative. Here it's a little bit below zero when the current is positive, so the power product there is negative, meaning that that's a power output from the driver coil into the body diodes. Uh, that, summed with power input and the reflection from the unusual secondary coil, is giving us that rather negligible input power. Now as to the output coil and the output magnetic circuit, if we look at this wave and take its time integral, we can see the flux. And the flux ends up being a sawtooth wave. If we take the time integral of this, of this uh, waveform here, we get kind of a clipped sinusoidal wave. Instead of the clipping happening at the zero crossings, uh, the clipping happens at the peaks when we take the time integral. So we end up getting two flux waveforms in the top and the bottom of the device that don't match each other at all. I think what ends up happening is because we have a sawtooth wave on the output flux and the sinusoid wave, remember it's sending this magnet into and out of saturation. What happens is that these, when the MOSFETs turn off, this uh, stops the, op the magnetic opposition common in all transformers is suddenly killed. The output coil cannot op oppose any change in flux. It allows a change in flux to happen, and very rapidly. What ends up happening when the timing is right is that it isn't so much the flux from the primary coil, it's basically off or rejecting the magnet's flux. We find that even with the sense winding around the magnets, the magnets are injecting their flux into the output coil. It's their flux, not the flux from the primary coil. We can see that because if I look at uh, the timing of the pulse from the sense coil around the magnet, it leads the timing of the, mo of the uh, spike from opening the MOSFETs. It's as if the, the, the magnets are happening earlier, they're pushing they precede the other action in time. And that's important. If they were lagging in time, they would be a load, but if they're leading in time, they're a source. Uh, we won't go into that right now and show it, but it does show that the magnet's flux is entering the output core. Um, as it induces DC and the flux drops, um, what ends up happening with the polarities of the flux is that the back reaction helps push the core into saturation more than it helps pull the core out of saturation. So. Uh, the primary core goes into saturation more easily than it uh, comes out, so it's, it's pushed in there, so the total amount of energy to, uh, required to get that extra magnetic energy that results in saturation uh, is less, and that's apparently why the load here reflects as a negative input power. And when it's tuned right, uh, we load the thing and the input power goes down and even goes negative. Uh, as a last curiosity, I'll show you this. I have a small wire here that's, excuse me, I'm so sorry, uh, that is wound around the junction between these two cores here. It's just a single turn, it's twisted, its output goes through a 220 kilo ohm resistor on each side, so it's balanced, and those terminate in some capacitors. I look at the voltage across those capacitors. Now, of course, in all known AC systems, uh, the time average of all the induced uh, EMF should be zero. We don't always find that in coils uh, if we put it right here because the current isn't always constant. Here the current is turning on and off with MOSFETs, it is over there as well. 
and that current creates its own voltage drop, and we can see the time average of that voltage drop doesn't have to be zero. But by definition, the time average of an induced current must be zero. If it was non-zero, we'd require a change in magnetic flux that's extending off into infinity, or we'd be tapping quantum dynamos or something exotic. So there is the looking across those capacitors. And let's take a look at what the voltmeter sees. On average, we tend to see about yeah, 10 to 15 microvolts, or 0 0.012 millivolts here. It's very weak DC. We can see that it's not zero. And it hangs there pretty reliably. So let's turn off the machine. Let's cut the current. Kill it. Light bulb's out. Everything's flatlined. And let's sit still and see what the display says. So here we see an offset inside the meter and inside the wiring of about 3 millivolts, which is not 12 millivolts. So although it's a very small difference, I'm sorry, that's in microvolts, although it's a very small difference of about 10 microvolts, it can't be accounted for with inductive theory. Turn it back on. See this reappear. We have 13 or 14 microvolts again. Turn it off. And of course we can watch it go away. It's after all the hiccuping of the machine going through its transitions is done. So something is giving us a little bit of voltage there that we see across the capacitors. It's very tiny, it's only coming out of a one-turn coil, but it's curious that it happens at all. It could be some vestigial response to interference inside the voltmeter. It could be a nonlinear VI characteristic inside these resistors. It could be things, but it also could be a slight amount of DC induction, which we would expect to accompany an over-unity device whose output is DC, even though there's no rectifiers on the inducing part of the output. I think that might be enough for now. I often just leave this thing on even though I'm taking the risks that it could break. But it doesn't break. It just runs. And it always seems to create about 10 watts of excess energy. By changing the duty cycle of these dwell times here, changing the pulse timing relative to the rest of the waves, we can get different input and output powers and different COPs, uh, but there's always an, a difference between the input and output powers of about 10 watts. The only thing that seems to scale that up and down uh, to first order is simply the input voltage and the amplitude of the signal on the primary. Right now we're peaking at 800 volts on either side, and would you believe it, the chips that are handling that 800 volts on the gate drivers are those tiny little surface mount chips on the board carriers that you see on the center of the screen right there and right there. Those are by Silicon, Te Silicon Labs. Sorry, their technology is pretty amazing. The chips that small uh, can do isolation and gate drivers up to 800 volts on a side. I just don't want to push them any, for any further and uh, find out where those chips fail. They're at their design limit. I can't go any further. So that locks me in at about 10 watts. With a better design over there, a better chipset that can go to higher voltages, uh, we shouldn't see that anymore. So the input circuit needs a redesign, and that's underway. There's some other coils being wound for that and some architecture being designed. But I think the, um, how do you say it? Well, the proof is more or less in the pudding, at least as far as watt meters are concerned. The next step, of course, is getting the losses out of the primary drive circuit, so we really only have to put in a fraction of a watt or something very near it. I suppose the last thing that's fair game to mention, so we can see on this power supply here, there's two power supplies. There's a, just about five volts going into the timing logic on this board. Uh, the crude watt meter on here says it's taking about 150 milliwatts. And then there's the 12 volt supply, that goes to the isolated supplies that are running the gate drivers on the input. 
as well as the isolated supply that's running the gate drivers on the output. I'm substantially overdriving uh, the silicon carbide MOSFETs on the output, although it's a robust thing to do so. If we zoom in right here, there's a gate protector soldered directly onto the gate and source of each MOSFET. It stops the gate voltage from ever taking an excursion beyond its absolute maximum. And even though I've put these things through torture and had all kinds of bad modes happening and self-oscillation and craziness, <coughs> excuse me, uh, twist my fingers, but I haven't lost a MOSFET yet. That ends up consuming a little bit of drive energy, so we see about uh, 1200 milliwatts or 1.2 watts driving that. So add it all together, safely assume the thing takes about a watt and a half of housekeeping. Uh, so for a closed loop we'd expect probably about 5 watts, which I'll be the first to say is never going to power the world and it may not be all that remarkable, but it does meet the long-standing 1 watt challenge and after all, it's power without fuel. Thanks for watching.